All right, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 9, the passage that I just referred to a few moments ago. It's the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we've been going through the four titles of Messiah, the four titles of the child born, the son given. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and then this morning, the Prince of Peace. Jason mentioned that it's the fourth Sunday of Advent, also known as the Angel's Candle or the Annunciation Candle. It is the Sunday where we celebrate the angels announcing not just the Incarnation, but the implications of the Incarnation, particularly as it revolves around peace. As a matter of fact, in Luke 2, verse 14, that Jason read, the angels announced, Peace on earth with whom God is well pleased. And yet, as we consider this Christmas in particular, perhaps, as we consider our lives, what's taking place around us, peace seems like an awfully rare commodity in our lives. Now, we're going to take a somewhat comical look at a very unfunny reality, and that is that peace is hard to come by. I'm going to show a brief clip from a film called Jingle All the Way. It stars Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, plays a character who is a, a sales guy, and he has put his career ahead of his family particularly ahead of his son's priorities. Sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back is Schwarzenegger misses a very huge karate uh, competition that his son was in, and his son is completely disappointed, completely disillusioned in his father. Schwarzenegger uh, feels guilty, and so he promises to make it up to his son. And the one gift his son wants for Christmas this year is Turbo Man. It is the most difficult gift to find. Everybody wants it. It is now Christmas Eve where we pick up the action, and Schwarzenegger and hundreds of other people are after Turbo Man. And it'll give you a glimpse into just how crazy life can be when it's supposed to be a celebration of the Prince of Peace. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. That reveals so many realities that we're facing in our own lives right now. How many of us are dealing with relational stress, relational hostility? Maybe just like Schwarzenegger, we have disappointed our children. Or maybe our children are disappointing us. Maybe there's tension in our homes. Or maybe our lack of peace is flowing out of vocational tension. It's the end of the quarter. It's the end of the year. It's time to perform. Or maybe we're facing other kinds of emotional stress, lack of peace, because we put so many expectations on this season. Or maybe there's financial lack of peace because we're spending money we don't have in order to try to make the season be all that we think it ought to be. Isaiah 9 is actually a passage whose very context involves tension, lack of peace, hostility, animosity. It's all about the Assyrian Empire moving from Iran and Iraq, moving westward to conquer God's people. And God's people are already experiencing division. The Old Testament church itself is divided. The tribes to the north of Israel are hostile 
against the tribes to the south, Judah. And into that context, God promises a child would be born. A son would be given. And his name would be Prince of Peace. Do you find yourself longing for peace this Christmas? I know you do. And I do too. And yet the good news is that is exactly what Jesus offers. Let's all stand out of reverence for the Word of God. Follow along as I read Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. This is God's Word. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. Folks, this is God's word. He gave it to us because he loves us. And he deeply longs for us to experience his peace. Let's pray. God, thank you for this passage. And thank you even more for the Prince of Peace. God, we all need peace, not just this Advent season, but all the time. Show us today how you have provided it in Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So the Prince of Peace is the Prince of the Hebrew word is called Shalom. It means wholeness. It means well-being. It means security. It means safety. Now, if you look at this passage, you'll notice that Isaiah presents it in terms of two different time frames. He talks about the former time, and he talks about the latter time. Now, the former time involves all kinds of different times. The former time, we're going to talk about soon here in a minute, uh, begins with the, the Garden of Eden and the fall of Adam and Eve into sin. But the former time also is talking about Isaiah's present day when the people of God, the church of God, is facing tumultuous times. But it's also talking about all of us before we come to know Christ, the former time. Then the passage talks about the latter time. The latter time to... Isaiah's day is the incarnation, the fulfillment of the promise of the Prince of Peace being born on Christmas Day. But the latter time also involves, as we are learning throughout Advent, 
the return of Christ. Because though peace is promised to us in Christ, we're never going to experience the peace God means for us to experience this side of eternity. That's one of the reasons why Christmas is so stressful for so many people. We're looking for a season to grant us what only eternity will usher in. Even for Christians, even for committed followers of Christ, we are not going to experience all that we dream of because the fulfillment awaits the most latter time, and that is the return of Christ. But in the meantime, there are three elements of peace that God promises us in this text. And we look to Jesus for those. So first of all, look to Jesus for spiritual peace. Now, even though Isaiah is addressing the Assyrian Empire, even though Jesus is address, or Isaiah is addressing trouble between the northern tribes and the southern tribes, Israel and Judah, the main reason we experience lack of peace is because we lack peace with God. It's like there's a domino effect of hostility and animosity. And it all begins with lack of peace with God. Lack of peace with God leads to a lack of peace within. And a lack of peace within leads to a lack of peace with one another. So the most important hostility and animosity that has to be dealt with, that is addressed in this passage, is we need spiritual peace. See, there's, because of sin, there's a two-sided hostility. And I know this doesn't sound very joyous, at least initially. This doesn't sound very Christmassy. But trust me, you have no hope of any peace in any area of your life at all unless you have peace established with God. You see, because of the fall, there is a two-sided hostility. Because of the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, and because of our own sin, God is hostile toward those outside of Christ. To even be less Christmassy, perhaps, the Bible even states that God hates sinners outside of Christ. The hostility and animosity of the Creator God against His human creatures apart from Christ is infinite. And so the first thing the Prince of Peace offers is to take upon himself the hostility and animosity of the Creator God and to suffer his wrath in our place. It says in verse 1, In the former time, he, that is God, brought into contempt the land of Zebulon. That is telling the story that in the former time, apart from Christ, in all of our lives outside of Christ, we are, we are brought into contempt by God. That's, that's hard at Christmas for us to say. But apart from Christ, we are contemptible to God. Now are you beginning to see why Christmas is so important? See, Christmas will never be special if we just look at it the way the world does. What makes Christmas special is that we are hated by God because of sin. We are held contemptible by God because of sin. 
And that is why verse 6 is so important. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And he will be called Prince of Peace. He is the one who brings us peace with God and will never have peace no matter our circumstances if we don't have peace with God. But that's only half of the bad news. The other half of the bad news, not only because of our sin does God hate us and hold us in contempt and, and have us under his wrath. And thankfully, he sent Jesus to bear his hostility. But we're also God-haters. We are conceived in sin, which by nature makes us God-haters. We have an aversion to Christ, every single one of us. And unless God changes that aversion, unless God removes that heart that despises the light, and loves the darkness, we will have no peace. And that's why it says in verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. John 3, verse 19, Jesus repeats this. He says the light has come into the world, but men, women, children, people loved the darkness more than the light. By nature, we are light haters. By nature, we are darkness lovers. Outside of Christ, we are Jesus haters. And Jesus comes not only to take upon himself the hostility of God that we deserve. Isaiah 53, verse 5, upon him was the chastisement that brings us peace. But Jesus as Lord also conquers our hearts. As it says in Ezekiel 36, 26 and following, he will take from us our heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. He will place his spirit within us, write his law on our hearts, and move us and inspire us and motivate us to love God's law, to love God's word, to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And until God's hostility with us and our hostility with God is dealt with, we will never, ever experience peace but notice this is in verse 7 the zeal of the lord god will do this no amount of your own efforts no amount of your own obedience no amount of your own praying your own attending church your own doing whatever it thinks you need to do that god wants you to do none of that will bring you peace with god none of that will give you a love for jesus no, the zeal of the Lord does this. And we receive the gift by faith. Laurie and I have had the privilege of going to Ireland numerous times. And, and one of the funny facts about Ireland is there seems to be more sheep than there are people. And if you look at uh, sheep fields long enough, you'll notice a particular sight. You'll notice a lamb that looks like it's wearing a lamb Halloween costume on top of its own coat. And if you see that, what it means is that lamb has been orphaned. That lamb's mother has died. Now, if the shepherd takes that lamb and tries to bring it to another mother lamb, that mother lamb will always reject it. It will cruelly butt it out of the mother's area of concern. And that, that orphan lamb will die. Why? Because the mother lamb will only take care of a lamb who has the scent of one of her own lambs. Now, oftentimes in a flock, not only are there lambs who lose mothers, but there are also mothers who lose lambs. And the good shepherd will take 
the dead lamb, skin it, and make a wool coat out of the dead lamb's skin, and will bring it to an orphan lamb and put the coat around the orphan lamb. So then when the orphan lamb with the coat of the dead lamb is brought to the mother of the dead lamb, the mother embraces the orphan as if it was her own lamb. If we transfer our hope and trust from ourselves to Jesus, if we allow Jesus to bear the hostility and animosity of the Father toward us because of our sin, we are clothed in Christ. And now we have the scent of the Savior and not the odor of an orphan. And we are taken in. And at the same time, the Spirit of God, that Spirit of adoption, also transforms and conquers our hearts so that we're no longer lovers of the darkness, but lovers of the light. Do you really know Jesus this Christmas? I'm not asking if you've been a member of a church your whole life. I'm not asking if you've walked an aisle. I'm not asking if you prayed a sinner's prayer. I'm asking, do you know Jesus? Because all that other stuff really doesn't matter. Have you trusted the Prince of Peace to take away God's hostility toward you? And are you looking to the Prince of Peace to conquer your own heart and to give you a deeper love for Jesus? Look to Jesus for spiritual peace. Secondly, now we can talk about looking to Jesus for personal peace. So often when we talk about peace, we actually are talking about this personal peace, this subjective sense that all is well, this subjective sense that I'm calm, I'm at rest, that I'm experiencing wholeness and safety and security. And because of the fall, we often don't experience that. Look at verse 1. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. Because of sin, we experience gloom. Because of, of difficult circumstances, trying situations, we experience lack of peace. We experience distress, sadness, anxiety, worry. But verse 6 tells us that the Prince of Peace is our hope for shalom in our experience personally, moment by moment, day by day. He is our peace. Now, where we tend to miss this is we tend to think peace is a factor of calm circumstances and stressless situations. But Micah 5, 4 and 5 says that He, Messiah, Savior, is our peace. And here's where things get all messed up. Thinking that peace is primarily circumstantial, we turn to control. And we seek to manufacture our own safe worlds. And the sad irony of that is that is actually the formula for losing any hope for peace. When we turn to self and control and manipulation of circumstances to try to maintain a safe world, ironically, that's the very thing that causes peace to fly out the window. No, it's as we understand that peace is internal, not circumstantial, that we stop trying to control our world. And we turn to the Prince of Peace who comes to us in whatever 
situation and circumstance we find ourselves. And in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the heartache, in the midst of all kinds of problems, Jesus becomes our peace. You know, one thing that really grieves the heart of the Lord, that really causes his heart to break for us, we find it in Luke 19, 42. As Jesus came to the hill overlooking Jerusalem, he wept. And do you know why he wept? He said, oh, Jerusalem, if only you, if only you had known what makes for peace. You see, Jerusalem was just like us, trying to manufacture, manipulate, and control situations and circumstances that we think will give us peace. And Jesus weeps because he says, like Micah 5, I am your peace. He says in the Gospel of John, in the world you have tribulation. If you think peace is a lack of tribulation, you're never going to experience peace because in the world you have tribulation. But Jesus says, take heart. I have overcome the world. You see, we don't have the power in ourselves to hold our world together. <laughs> that's, that's got to be one of the hardest but most basic foundational lessons any Christian can learn. You are not in control. And if you seek to control your world, you'll never experience personal peace. Laura and I just got back from New York uh, City. We, we love going to the city during Christmas time. And uh, right there at Rockefeller Center at uh, Fifth Avenue, and I think it's 49th Street, on that side of Rockefeller Center, uh, there's a statue of Atlas. You know the story of Atlas, right? Atlas was a titan, a giant, and he lost uh, a battle. He lost a war. And the consequence of his loss and defeat was that he had to bear earth in the universe. He had to hold it up. And, and keep it in its place in the universe. And as you look at the statue with Atlas, uh, with the world on his shoulder, he's straining under the weight. And you can tell there's absolutely no peace. It's a curse. There's no peace. That's one way to live. How many of us are living that way this Christmas? Right across the street. By the way, I did this with a fraternity brother of mine and his wife that Laura and I met up with in New York City. We showed him that, and then we walked into St. Patrick's Cathedral on the other side of the street, which I think is 5th Avenue and 50th Street. If you go into St. Patrick's Cathedral and move toward the front of the church, there's an altar. And on that altar, you'll find a little statue of Jesus as a boy. And his, in his hand, he's holding the entire world. And there's no sweat on his brow. And there's no strain on his face. So how are you choosing to live this Christmas? Are you trying to be Atlas? And control your world? trying to hold it up? Or are you looking to Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to show up in your life in the midst of all your crazy circumstances and to give you peace? Look to Jesus for spiritual peace. Look to Jesus for personal peace. Then finally, look to Jesus for relational peace. The final domino Right? Remember what I said? Peace is like dominoes. The, the most important hostility and animosity and lack of harmony that we need to deal with is spiritual. If you don't have peace with God, you're never going to have peace within. If you don't have peace within, you're never going to have peace with others. If you have peace with God, then there's hope for peace within. And if there's peace within, there's hope for peace within with others. Look at verse 4. 
the yoke of his burden, the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. Look, part of the reality of living in a fallen world is that we live with broken relationships. There is hostility in homes. There is animosity in families. There's relational tension and brokenness all around us. And our only hope is that Jesus will break the rod of oppression. There are children oppressing parents. There are parents oppressing children. There's husbands oppressing wives. There's wives oppressing husbands. And every relational configuration you can imagine, there is the presence of the possibility of hostility and animosity, tension and brokenness. You know, one of the most honest Christmas carols is, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. You ever read the words to that? And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. How many of us can relate to that this Christmas? This whole idea of a prince of peace just seems to mock us. The angel's annunciation of peace on earth, goodwill with those whom God has pleased just seems to mock us. But if we would look to Jesus, the prince of peace, not only will he give us peace with God, And not only will he grant us peace within ourselves, personal peace, he will also, verse 7, increase peace with one another. Now, we may not experience it perfectly in this life. Because remember, Advent's a time of longing. Advent points us not only to the present and Jesus visiting us where we are, but to the future. That ultimately we're never going to experience anything like what we think we will or ought to until Christ returns. But it does say in verse 4, the rod of his oppressor you have broken. In verse 5 it talks about the weapons of war, the boot of the warrior, the shirts, the uniforms rolled in blood. God burns all of it for fuel. That will happen one day. But it can begin happening in our lives now. And verse 7 again reminds us of the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. And that's why the final verse of the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, goes like this. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right Prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. The gospel of Jesus Christ will not fail. The Prince of Peace will not abandon you. And that is our hope for even relational peace with those around us. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those who follow Christ are peacemakers. Romans 14, 17 to 19. Let us pursue that which makes for peace. Have you heard about the story? It's, it's a documentary. It's called The Straight Story. It's about a 73-year-old man named Alvin Strait. And he is out of sorts with his brother, Lyle. When I say out of sorts... They are hostile toward each other. Something happened, and they haven't spoken in decades. Alvin gets word that his brother Lyle has just suffered a stroke. Might die, might be paralyzed. Alvin has no way to contact his brother. Alvin Strait has a 1966 John Deere lawn tractor. He is 500 miles away from his brother Lyle. He hops on the lawn tractor, 
spending the night in people's yards who are hospitable enough to allow him to do so. It takes him six weeks to get to his brother Lyle's house. He drives down the dirt road, he finds the wood shack, and he cries out, Lyle! And there's no response. And he wonders if he's too late. That maybe the stroke has taken his brother and there is no time for reconciliation. But then he hears a muffled response. Alvin? Is that you? And this weak man comes out with a walker and stares at his brother Alvin and then looks at the 1966 John Deere tractor and looks back at Alvin and then looks at the tractor. His eyes fear, fill with tears. His voice starts quivering and he says, you came all the way here on that to see me. And Alvin says, yup. And Alvin starts weeping. And there's reconciliation. Jesus didn't come on a 1966 John Deere tractor. But he traveled from heaven to earth and took on human flesh. And he's calling out your name. Are you going to respond? Will you allow reconciliation to occur with God, within yourself, with others? Wouldn't it be great if we could just take a, like a peace pill or drink a peace potion, and everything would be great? Well, that's not too far-fetched, actually, because this is a table of peace. And though it's not magic, and though it's not a potion, it is a table of power. And the Scriptures tell us that we come to this table in repentance and faith, that the Spirit of God falls on us in such a way that our peace with God is increased. Our peace within is increased. And the potential of our peace with others is increased as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this table. We thank you it's a table of reconciliation, vertically, horizontally, internally, God, we pray you'll set these elements apart from their common use. We pray you'd use these elements to grant us more of the Prince of Peace and more of his gift of peace. In Jesus' name, amen.